This video is brought to you by our amazing supporters over at Patreon. Hey everyone, it's Ben from Board to Bits, and this is the first in a set of videos I'm going to do about some things that you should consider as you go throughout your game development process. This series arose out of a few questions I've seen uh, about things like file management or how to store like level data and save data and stuff like that. But I think to really be successful in a game development project, you need to take a step further back. The really big question you need to ask is, where does your game logic lie? And I will know that this is something that should maybe happen after you do something like prototyping a game idea or a mechanic, just to avoid making any assumptions while it's still just kind of an idea in your head. But once you've done that and you've kind of proven that a system can work, it's probably a good idea to plan to then kind of take this step, ask about this game logic, and plan to like clean up your code and stuff based on the answers you find. Now this wasn't really a qu as much of a question, or at least it was a very different kind of question, I think, as far back as five or ten years ago, like before Unity was really popular or Unreal Engine, things like this were available, when developers were really just creating their own game engines, because in those cases, you were really building the engine tailored to the needs of the game itself, and so the game logic, assuming that you were kind of following best practices, would naturally fall where it should within your um, kind of code structure. With Unity now, however, it's kind of built as more of an all-purpose solution, and there are really a few ways that you can handle and execute your code. Now, chances are you'll probably use a mix of these solutions, but it's important to know which ones you're using where and why you're using them. So first off, you can use mono behaviors to make components which you'll attach to game objects, and you can use those components and really have them designed to make use of other components in game objects, objects in the scene. This is what I would consider to be kind of the game object approach, really using Unity's built-in systems. Another thing you can do is create classes with more self-contained logic. Now these may also be components, but the difference is they're really, they're not designed to impact or depend on the outside game world. Really the only reason they're, if they are components, the only reason they are is to take advantage of methods like awake and update. But they're really, like I say, self-contained and only kind of communicate with each other and don't really care about all the other stuff that Unity is doing. So I call this the class-driven approach. Another thing you have are scriptable objects, which can contain both data and methods, and these can then be attached to either type of component. And finally, you have things like data files, like XML or JSON or MySQL, which can actually exist outside of your main game build so that you could um, edit them externally and things like that, but are still, you know, kind of part of that structure. Now that last category really only tends to deal with the data and not really the behaviors and logic, so we can kind of ignore that for now. Um, likewise, because scriptable objects can really be attached to either of the other two types of options, they're really kind of a neutral system and they don't really factor into this particular discussion. So what we can really look at when we're looking at where our logic lies in our game is either does it lie in the classes or in the game objects. So for example of how we could break this, break this apart, um, here is a quick screenshot from a scene in the game I'm working on right now. It's a top-down RPG. And we have this world here, we've got some different obstacles, we've got trees and rocks and grass, and we have our player character. Now let's say I pressed the, the down button in my game that should make this character walk down on the screen. How is that going to be handled? And the answer of how that is handled will tell us a lot about where the game logic is lying in our game. So for example, if I'm developing this with a class-driven logic, then when I press the down button, the player itself doesn't do anything. Instead, what's going to happen is we're going to look at, we probably have some kind of a game controller script, and that's going to be tracking where every object is on a something like a two-dimensional array. If this is a tile-based game, we could kind of see this whole screen that we're seeing here as a bunch of individual, um, individual elements or objects in a two-dimensional array. And then, so each prop, each um, prop, and you know the player and all that that we're seeing here positioned is based on that data array. So when I press that down button, instead of actually moving the character, what we do is we look in that data array, look at the player's position, and then look at the what object is one position below that in that array. And then we kind of ask a lot of questions. We're saying, is there an object there? There's an obstacle there, does it block movement, is it an enemy, does it cause damage? Check against all of these things. If, as long as the player is not blocked from moving down, as long as it's not like a hard object there, then the player can be transposed to that position. And then from there, all of our game objects in our world will kind of 
take a look and see, hey, has anything changed here? Oh, the player has moved, and so that player object will move itself down. And it might do that either by snapping into position or, you know, kind of translating itself over a few frames. So that's one way. That's handling it in the data, and then everything here, all these, all these game objects that we see on the screen are really kind of, they don't even know about each other necessarily. They're really just relying on that data information to tell them where to go. The other approach that we can take um, is when we press the down button, our player object, this, this game object player character, actually does start moving down. And we can either do this by moving its transform position or moving its rigid body by applying a force or a velocity, something like that. Now the player is also probably going to have a collider component on them, which is going to check that as they're moving down, do they hit any other colliders. If we do hit a collider, then we need to check, is this a trigger so I can move through it, or is it not a trigger and it's going to stop me? Is this an enemy? Does it cause damage? All those same questions again. And so instead of looking at data and determining whether or not something should be moved, things are going to try to move, and then the physics, physics engine will kind of help, help us out and handle whether or not the move is successful. Neither is necessarily right or wrong, and it really depends on what you're trying to build. If you're trying to build, say, a roguelike, where you, everything is really tightly adhered to tiles and um, isn't ever going to kind of stray in that way, then class-driven logic is probably a good fit for your game. However, if you're trying to do like a more um, action RPG, like a, you know, kind of like a Legend of Zelda style thing, where you're able to move around more freely, then you probably want to use the component-based system and let Unity's physics engine handle things so that you can move around a little bit more free-flowingly. Again, neither of these is right or wrong. They both just have their own purposes. Now, the important thing about all this in this exercise is that now you know where your stuff is existing, and that's really going to imp impact things, like I've said before, your file hierarchies and you know how your data is structured and things like that. Ultimately, you want those file structures, your um, how you're saving your data, all that stuff, to work with your game design. If you're having to fight the tools you're working with, that's like a number one way that you're not going to finish your game because it's going to be frustrating for you to try and work with that. So it really helps to know what kind of the core spirit of your system is so that you can do things that kind of go with the grain and make the simplest um, and easiest system to work with for you. So anyway, I'm going to wrap up this video um, kind of on that note right now. Hopefully this gives you a better idea of looking at how your game is working and um, how you can work with your game in the future which can hopefully make you uh, more successful in completing more games. In the meantime, thanks for watching and good luck with your game dev.